with the German word. So this is a congress, maybe some of you knew that, from uh, Google, very open-minded and open space congress in Arizona. Maybe he's got some new ideas from there also. We're really looking forward to hearing right now. After his uh, keynote, uh, we will have a dialogue, and dialogue means a dialogue with you and with uh, Michael Tetman from the International Advertising Association, I. A -A. So, first we're going to hear my Nardi Nardis and then Michael Tatman will ask some questions and you always be free to ask your questions. So, very welcome and thanks for traveling through the night to my Nardi Nardis, CEO Worldwide, OMD. Very welcome. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> Looks like many people decided to have lunch instead to listen to my presentation, but uh, I hope you will enjoy it nonetheless. I'm going to try to be quick so that you can join everybody else for, uh, for lunch. Now, uh, the title of my presentation is uh, The Digital Inflection Point. And uh, as, you can, as you can see, the word digital is uh, between brackets. And there is a specific reason for that. I don't like the word digital. I think that. Uh, it, uh, it has passed its time, and I think that is divisive. I think it separates instead of uh, uh, uniting. As, as a consumer, as an individual, for me digital means uh, accessing information, news, entertainment, being connected with my friends, uh, have an opportunity to share. As uh, a marketeer, as an agency, I think digital for me means uh, the electricity <laughs> that empowers uh, every marketing program. As such, as the electricity that empowers everything else, we don't talk about electricity. We don't say uh, we're going to have a cold beer thanks to the fridge that works with electricity. It's obvious. It's taken for granted. It's part of our life. It's part of everything. It doesn't need to be specified anymore. It doesn't need to divide. It doesn't need to separate, to separate in a world which is becoming more and more uh, integrated. I've, uh, I've taken this title, the, uh, the digital, the inflection uh, point, from a book written by Andy Grove, the co-founder of Intel. Uh, he wrote this book called Only the Paranoid uh, Survives. And he talks about uh, the strategic inflection point of a business, which is uh, the time in which you have to fundamentally change in order to grow, or you risk becoming obsolete. So it's, uh, it's like the cliff, uh, where you get to the point and you've got to change, otherwise you, uh, you fall. I've taken that, that title because I think that in the digital, I've got to reuse this word many times today, I think we are exactly at the same stage. We're forced to change, but not always we have realized and fully understood how to change, and many people are still uh, slightly, uh, slightly scared. I'm going to talk about the two things today. Uh, the first one, I would like to have a look at where the global digital landscape is going over the next uh, two, three years, uh, just to share some view over what's going to happen next and how will it, uh, will it shape. And the second, probably more important, is how will it continue to shape and change the fundamental principles of consumer uh, engagement. But, uh, let me show you a very short video to, uh, to demonstrate why I think that uh, digital really has become the electricity that powers uh, marketing programs.
Now, before I start, uh, let, me, let, me, let me ask a couple of questions uh, to you so we get to know each other better and I understand better who I have in front. Just a couple of questions. How many of you are a member of at least, to say, two social networks? Can you put your hands up? It looks like 90-95% uh, of uh, the people in the room. Second question. How many of you have spent at least $100 uh, on an online transaction, say, in the last uh, 30, 60 days? $100 or, or more? Okay, 90-95%, fantastic. It's, uh, I have to say that, uh, uh, and I knew what to expect today, but I have to say that unfortunately at, uh, at other conferences, other gatherings uh, which are part of, of our industry, sometimes with this kind of questions, uh, even now in 2010, eh, you get answers like 40-50%, uh, uh, which uh, sometimes is very worrying. And, and you understand that you are speaking to, uh, to people that lead an entirely different life uh, and they are not really participating in the same world that, uh, that we are. Anyway, the, the presentation today I would like to talk about three things. The first one is a look at the today realities, what really matters and what are the phenomena today that will really shape the trends of tomorrow. The second one are the key global digital trends that we expect to take center stage over the next two, three years. What are the implications of these trends and how are they going to change uh, marketing communication going forward? And the third one is, is just a view, a suggestion of what we think that leading marketeers need to do in the future as an entire organization, not just from the top, in order to, to, be, to be a part of this new life and to get ahead of this, of this curve. So let's start by grinding ourselves in, in the key phenomenon in the digital space today that, that really matter. And we have identified four areas. Uh, which, uh, uh, which we think uh, are important to us. And let's expand uh, on each of one of them. You probably know all of them. The first one is the economy. Uh, in essence, uh, how this is going to, the economical downturn, how is it going to impact on digital behavior? What has happened in the last two years? Uh, has it really changed the life of, of consumers? Access, uh, how the changing phase of access is accelerating and transforming uh, digital engagement. Uh, mobility, uh, what is happening in a world which is becoming more and more unrestricted. Uh, and social, it's not just about Facebook and, uh, and Twitter, but how this new identity system, which is the, the, the behavioral overlay uh, of the web, uh, is really influencing everything we do from search uh, to commerce uh, to, uh, to communication. Let's look at them uh, one by one. Starting from the economic ripple effect, which, uh, which has so much accelerated and cemented different trends and behaviors over the last 24 months. And what we have done uh, over the last year, year and, and a couple of months, is a big research across 19 markets uh, with consumers, qualitative and uh, quantitative, to, to understand what's happening and to get some numbers and, uh, and some trends. What, uh, what we find fascinating is that behind this uh, nine universal consumer behavior which emerged, uh, digital is a common thread across uh, all of them, across each one of them. And uh, let me just pick three uh, as an example of behaviors which I think that will, will continue way after the, uh, the recession and the downturn is, uh, is finished. The first one is cocooning, which is about staying in, staying at home, doing things in a different way. Uh, benefit from uh, digital uh, entertainment, gaming, streaming TV, downloads music, movies, uh, using digital at home to do things uh, without the need to, uh, to go out. The second one that I wanted to mention is free fun, which really is everything which is low cost entertainment uh, via the net, uh, being it on a, on a mobile or a fixed uh, platform. And the third one, which is important, is brace on buying, where more consumers are really seeking out price comparisons, deals, bulk buying, coupons uh, via the web. It has really accelerated this trend, which was there, of course, before the, the recession, but it has accelerated to uh, a new level uh, today. I think these uh, this numbers provide a bit more textures on the smart shopping uh, behavior uh, I was mentioning. And you can see how the internet is really playing a significant role in enabling the smart shoppers to research products, compare prices, get better deals online, much more than they did before the recession. And 
If, uh, if you have a look at this chart, uh, talking about free fun and, and cocooning, uh, don't read the, de the details because you can't see it, uh, but uh, uh, on the left, uh, on the blue bars, uh, you can see behaviors that the consumers are doing more after the crisis. Uh, things like uh, chatting, socializing, streaming video, uh, surfing. On the right, on the contrary, in the yellow bars, uh, you see what consumers are doing uh, less, which is uh, going to live events, uh, movies, uh, museums, doing things outside, uh, and normally things that have uh, a price and, uh, and a ticket uh, connected to this. Now, the big question that we're asking about ourselves, and of course nobody has uh, the, the answer, is are these trends going to continue? Are they set in stone? Are we going to see them for the next five, ten years? Or were they just examples during the last 24 months uh, because of specific uh, events which have happened? Well, we can only listen to, uh, to consumers and what they say, three out of four of them, is that they are there to stay. They are there as a permanent behaviour which is going to, to cover their life uh, in, uh, in the future. The second uh, uh, force which is shaping the future, as I was saying, is, uh, is access. And it's really transforming uh, digital uh, engagement because of uh, connectivity, uh, which is becoming much more wireless, uh, broadband, which is enabling uh, much richer and faster uh, connections uh, every day, the launch of 4G, etc., etc., and devices which have really become multi dimensional gateways to, uh, to content more than uh, single pieces of, uh, of hardware. The lines are blurring, all the devices are becoming the, the same and they seem to do similar things. The smartphone uh, nowadays looks like a gaming device, the gaming console is looking a lot like a, a home entertainment console and the iPad is really merging the capabilities of laptop, smartphone, e-reader and uh, another device. So it's really critical that we understand how to develop seamless cross-platform content and messaging uh, strategies. Seamless, because we may see the difference between a device and, and the other, we may have different strategies, but the consumer certainly doesn't. He gets and he hears and he listens to this buzz, he gets a conversation. He doesn't know where it comes from, nor is it relevant where it comes from. It's a conversation that is happening seamlessly across all uh, the, uh, the devices. We think in terms of uh, platforms, the consumer obviously uh, doesn't. Now, the real news uh, is that the next billion internet users will leapfrog straight to the mobile web experience, bypassing the PC-based experience as we know it, because that's where we, uh, we come from as a generation. And the majority of these new users will come from emerging, very populous uh, countries like uh, China, like India, like uh, big parts of, uh, of, uh, of Africa. The third grounding point, looking at, uh, at current ongoing uh, trends, uh, is the era of, of mobility, which is so profoundly changing the game for, for consumers and, uh, and marketers. And uh, we are using uh, appropriately, I think, the term mobility and not mobile, because it's not just about the mobile phone, it's a lot more than, uh, than the mobile phone. It's, it's really about a portable web uh, experience, whatever form the, uh, the hardware that may uh, manifest itself uh, in. And, uh, and mobility is much bigger than the mobile phone uh, alone, because while, while we know the smartphone penetration is expected to reach 40% worldwide over the next three years, which is, which is a huge number, and many people believe it's underestimated, and that it actually may be much more than 40% over the next three years. This is only a very, very small part of what Morgan Stanley has uh, predicted to be 10 billion wireless devices in use by 2013. 2013 is, uh, is tomorrow. 10 billion uh, devices uh, at a wireless uh, level. And I mean, this really, again, what I said before, it really forces us to think about how to engage with consumers across an entire ecosystem of wireless uh, devices. Smartphones, networks, tablets, e-readers, handheld gaming devices, GPS devices, etc., etc., etc. We look at them as separate platforms, the consumer doesn't. How do we have a message which is totally consistent and it reaches the same people and it generates conversations using so many different uh, platforms? But let's ground ourselves uh, even more in these numbers and let's look at another couple of statistics that help to understand the magnitude, the scale uh, of the developments. 
Going back to mobile phone, uh, penetration globally today is uh, at uh, 4 billion uh, subscribers, which is a huge number if you think of the, of the worldwide population. But let's do some comparisons with, uh, with other devices. This means there is uh, two and a half times the number of uh, PCs, three and a half times the number of landline uh, phones, uh, which by the way is, uh, is beginning now to decline, and four times the number of, uh, of televisions. And uh, if we look at the future, over the next two years, uh, these 4 billion people will become 5.5 billion people, which is uh, 77, 80% of the worldwide uh, population. And as we said before, 40% of these uh, of this, uh, 5.5 billion are uh, smartphones. And I think that the most important point on this slide is that the mobile phone will overtake the PC as the most common web access device within the next three years. Again, this is a well-known statistic. Is it three years or is it two? Are we going to get there much faster than we expected? And personally, I think yes. And I think this creates a huge challenge for agencies, for marketers, for clients, for the industry, really, in that we still have so much to learn about mobile as a marketing platform, and we don't have time anymore because we are there. It's happening in front of us. PC-based uh, mobile, PC-based activities are also migrating uh, to, uh, to mobile uh, devices. As you can see from this staggering statistics uh, on this chart, a substantial amount of shopping uh, transactions, social networking, uh, search queries, uh, video streaming will occur on mobile devices over the next uh, uh, two, three years. And every time we, and I'm sure you've seen other examples of these numbers uh, uh, over the last few hours or yesterday, but every, every time we see these numbers, they're changing, they're bigger, and everything is happening uh, faster. The final and perhaps one of the most important grounding points in terms of today realities is the social uh, web. And, uh, this is a really critical one because uh, it's a lot more than some of the questions that uh, we, we often hear in our business and in our industry. What should my Facebook strategy be? What should my Twitter strategy be? We really need to reframe this perspective uh, entirely because social is really is now the identity system, the behavioral overlay of the entire web, influencing everything from search to commerce to communication, enforcing a profound change in the rules of consumer uh, engagement. And let me give you a, a couple of examples. If we look first at the dawn of the social search, social search, we can see what Google and Bing are doing, and I don't know, two or three examples. Google's real-time search includes real-time social media feeds from a variety of sources, and lists them within its organic search results. Google social search provides a more focused search result based on users' of social uh, graph. Uh, Bing's, uh, Bing tweets, uh, like Google Real Time, is harnessing uh, live feeds from Twitter into, into their search results. And now, these are just examples, and some of these products have been more successful or will be more successful than, than others. What I think is really important is that the direction towards an increasingly personalized web is very clear and is there to stay, towards a much more personalized uh, web. The, uh, the second area that brings uh, this evolving role of uh, social to life is uh, the socialization of commerce, which is influencing uh, many new business uh, models. Let me just focus on, on the second example that we have on, uh, on this chart, uh, which is how the so socialization of commerce uh, can be leveraged as a powerful marketing approach. And this is an example from uh, Dell and uh, Intel uh, last year in, in Singapore where they partner, these two companies, both, both clients of ours, uh, to leverage what they call the power of the swarm, uh, which essentially was uh, consumers being encouraged to reach out to their entire social graph and invite them to join in on a great uh, deal. And the larger the group, the lower the purchase price of, uh, of the computers. And the numbers kept uh, becoming higher and higher and higher, way beyond the expectations of the plan at the beginning, so much so that they're now thinking of rolling this out, uh, certainly across Asia Pacific and possibly across the, uh, the world. So the consumer really taking uh, an important role within their social system and using their communities to drive down the price of something that, that they would like to, uh, to buy. 
So if social is uh, rewriting the rules of uh, consumer engagements, I think there are three uh, impactful, uh, meaningful and actionable trends uh, that we can uh, learn and take and, uh, and use. I think the first one is that sharing is the new giving. And this has a lot of implication in terms of the type of, the type of content and brand experiences that we create, because unless these are valuable, entertaining, relevant, uh, they will be absolutely uh, meaningless. The second rule is that participation is the new consumption, and this is about recognizing that consumers have become active participants and contributors. They're not passive, they're, they're participating and they're building uh, content uh, themselves. The third one is that consumer reviews are the new advertising, and this is possibly the, uh, the most important one. And I think that uh, the notion is that the conversation is happening uh, with us or without us. It's just happening. The conversation is moving on. And very scarily, 25% of search results today for the world's top 20 brands are linked to content created by consumers. So 25% of search results for the world's top 20 brands are linked to content created by consumers. This is a, this is a, this is a monstrous change. Yeah, they don't make it to the top. They're not in the first page, they're not in the first top five or, or the top ten, but they're getting there. So consumer-generated content getting in the top of, uh, of search uh, results. And I think that the conclusion of these uh, three uh, thoughts, sharing the new giving, participation is the new consumption, and consumer reviews are the new advertising, is that we really need to be thinking much more holistically and strategically about engagement strategies that link together paid, owned and earned uh, assets in the same way that the consumer sees them. So if we have talked about today, what are the most significant and actionable uh, global digital trends uh, over the next uh, two, three years? And, and we think there are uh, four uh, which are shaping the future of, uh, of engagement. And we call them fluid, focused, fast and, uh, and forecastable. And uh, let me start with, uh, with fluid and a couple of examples. Uh, and by fluid we mean uh, what speaks to the borderless exchange of uh, data between consumers, between platforms, and between a platform and, uh, and, an, and a consumer. As I said, let me show you uh, two or three uh, examples. Let me put all of them on, on the charts so it's easier and, uh, and quicker. If we talk about fluid experience, well, look at layer of mental reality browser where uh, through a camera or a cell phone uh, you can see the, uh, the surrounding and the, and the layer of extra information uh, within uh, and beyond the landscape you are you're watching. And if you think of the implication this could have in last-minute decisions, in creating new opportunities for consumption, in informing about new products, in getting the consumer closer to places that he may not have been looking for in, uh, in the last uh, minute. If you look at fluid uh, if you look at fluid content, a good example is, uh, um, is what Ford is doing with, with the sync, which is a factory installed in-car communication and entertainment systems, which puts together uh, the mobile phone, other digital uh, media players, and allows to use uh, the commands on the steering wheel uh, or the volume controls uh, to play all of this uh, together, giving access uh, to, hopefully not to drivers, but to the people sitting next to the driver, uh, giving them access to their Twitter account, browsing maps, uh, listening to internet radio, uh, check the movie times, have the, have the car systems helping them to, uh, to control uh, and navigate. Uh, the third one uh, could be, an example could be uh, Microsoft or Project Natal, where uh, for the Xbox 360, which really enables the users to, to control and interact with, with Xbox without the need to touch the, the game controller, uh, where the, the system can read and react to gestures, spoken commands, uh, and read objects and, uh, and images as presented to them. And the fourth one is one that we all know very, very well in the area of the fluid transactions. Take uh, mobile in, uh, in Japan, for example, where consumers can now pay at McDonald's uh, just by swiping their cell phones uh, or using them for, uh, for a train uh, fare and really making the use of money, of cash, uh, absolutely uh, redundant in, uh, in today's economy. Uh, or TwitPay could be another example in, in fluid, fluid uh, transactions where there's a Twitter-based service that allows users to send the money between people, uh, between Twitters, without having to go through a separate channel like a bank, uh, which traditionally charges uh, money and takes time uh, at, every, uh, at every step. 
The next future trend is, uh, is focused, uh, and this is really all about uh, pinpoint accuracy in terms of uh, targeting, in terms of location, and in terms of uh, uh, messaging. And uh, again, I can give you a couple of, uh, uh, of examples. Uh, focused uh, targeting, is, uh, which you can see on the top uh, left, uh, is all about the opportunity to, to deploy this rich insights provided by social media and mobile uh, to further understand and work with, uh, with the target uh, consumer base. It's not just the who, where, when and, uh, and what, but it's uh, also uh, behavior location, mood, social interactions, so we can have a much better one-on-one -on -one, uh, conversation with, uh, uh, with this uh, uh, identified uh, consumers. Uh, Foursquare doesn't need any, uh, any introduction. H how many people in the audience use uh, Foursquare? A bit less here, but 20-25% it looks uh, from, uh, from the number. I think you all, you all know what it is and it's, uh, and it's becoming and it's developing uh, into a fantastic uh, community, community enablers where friends can listen uh, and act based on your suggestions, tips, uh, and reach uh, you or others into places which have been recommended, going way beyond the knowledge of the places themselves. It doesn't matter if it's the restaurant, the bar, the museum, the, the club, the normal don't even know this is happening, and, uh, and probably the next stage is how to exploit that commercially, because effectively communities are driving traffic to different places, and that traffic has, uh, has a value. And in terms of focus messaging, I think that uh, Amazon uh, recommendation engine is a very good example of what smart messaging is, is and doesn't need any, uh, any introduction. The, the next trend is called fast, uh, and as it says, uh, is everything not happening just faster than before, but I think the concept is things happening in uh, real time. And again, I've got three uh, examples on uh, fast engagement, fast insights, uh, and the fast uh, analysis, where for fast engagement, take, take McDonald's uh, as an example, when they use the QR uh, codes uh, in Japan uh, to deliver product and promotional information in, in real time by having the code on uh, the Big Mac uh, packaging. So that they could distribute through the QR code immediate real-time uh, nutritional information uh, that could be accessed immediately and could be updated instantly every time there was a change in, uh, in the recipe without the need of uh, reprinting and redoing and redistributing uh, all the packaging. So there was a real value for the company and there was a real value for uh, the consumer. Fast insight and fast analysis, I think you can look at them uh, together. It's, uh, on one side is uh, how to harness uh, all these insights coming from uh, relevant social media and trend forums and sites and how to deploy them in real time so they can help uh, us to take uh, better decisions. And think, for example, of uh, ad exchanges uh, uh, on the trading side or think of dashboards where we are all investing so much money in making sure that this series of massive information become available to us, to our clients, so that decisions can be taken with real-time data and not just looking at insights on data that is based on 6, 12, uh, 18 months uh, before and that is in most cases uh, not relevant uh, anymore. The next big trend, and probably the most important, is uh, forecastable. And, uh, uh, and it's all about having a much more robust uh, measurement framework uh, ultimately to be able to identify what are the leading indicators of what business success looks like. Of course, that is a holy grail. It's what we all look forward to, have all the information that can predetermine how to reach success within the next marketing program. And don't look at this in too much detail because there is too much information inside and this is just a framework to help taking decisions which are much more data driven. And if we look at the, the way that Intel's uh, measurement system uh, and principles are, there are two things which I think are very important that uh, they have adopted, and I have to say that we as an agency have learned so much from them. The first principle that they have is measuring what uh, really matters. What activities do we really value along with the purchase funnel, or whatever the purchase path that looks like? And the second one, what is the actionable data that we have relative to, to that question? Because anything else really should not be a priority because too often we suffer from uh, data paralysis, too much information, too much contrasting information, which is not really helping us to take a real-time, quick, relevant uh, decision. 
And the second uh, principle which they apply, which I think is fascinating, is how you then connect all the dots between the engagement touch points, including both online and offline, using this data. And, uh, and here you start to have a bigger picture and to identify the leading indicators of what is happening with, uh, with the business. Now, with that... Uh, if I manage to click... With that picture and that framework in, uh, in mind, I think that uh, if we agree on all of that, that, there are a few lessons that can be taken from here, and we've tried to codify it into eight points that we think are important for us as an agency, we think they're important for our clients, and we think they're important for, uh, for the industry. So let me go through these eight points very quickly, and then perhaps we can discuss them in, uh, in the Q&A uh, later. What are the strategic implications of what is happening today and the trends which are happening and shaping the industry over the next 24, 36 months? The, uh, the first one, as we see it, is to have a transition uh, mindset. Organizations need to transition their mindset to think about digital as an enabler to achieve broader business objectives, not just as a media channel, because it's not just a media channel. The second one is have a vision. We think the marketeers should have a vision that asks, what are we trying to solve for? And how can digital help? How can you provide the solution to this, uh, to this marketing uh, opportunity? The third one that we mentioned before is uh, apply uh, a consumer uh, lens. Because we need to recognize that, that this new ecosystem is uh, seamless, is borderless, and it crosses all platforms as seen by the consumers, not as seen by uh, by us, uh, the, uh, the marketeers. So all strategies and initiatives and messaging need to be in sync, from marketing to communication to retail uh, to recruiting. We have to eliminate silos. Uh, it's the only way to achieve uh, holistic strategies and executions. Organizations really must eliminate, or at very least, bridge the silos, uh, which are still so much existing in, uh, in our business. The fifth one is to become a living brand, and the idea <coughs> here is that brands have to become much more dynamic and human, and actively listen, learn, participate, share, engage with the key constituents, constituents that, that they, uh, they play in with. Number six is to champion a beta uh, mindset. We need to test, we need to learn, we need to facilitate innovation and experimentation and sharing of these best practices in order to stay ahead of uh, uh, these changes in the digital economy. The seventh one for us is learn uh, and share, mandating continuous digital learnings and sharing of best practices to help organizations to be more nimble, more agile in this extremely fast-paced uh, world. And the eighth and, uh, and last is to define strategic metrics. What, what really uh, defines uh, and measures the, uh, the core business objectives? How do we move away from uh, fluffy, uh, I call them, uh, marketing KPIs and move to proper measurable business KPIs? It doesn't matter if it is uh, sales, uh, loyalty, productivity, trial, but really measurable and identifiable KPIs. And how can we as an industry be measured on the successes so that our whole remuneration is based on delivering of a KPI which affects the sales or the success of the brands that our clients are, uh, are marketing? And I think that is possibly the, uh, the most important one, how to create a new currency and a new measurement across the whole ecosystem to measure not just uh, the outputs in separate ways, which is what we've been doing for the last 20 years, even before the, the digital era, but how can we measure conversations, including everything which goes from paid to owned uh, to earned, and have a real value, and using that for trading in, <coughs> in media, and understanding what final effect it will have on the sales of, uh, of the product. Okay, and I think we've discussed a lot of exciting opportunities and, and challenges, many challenges for, uh, for the future, and I thought it was only fitting to end on this famous uh, quote from, from Darwin, which always reminds us that responsiveness to change is the only trace that guarantees uh, survival. If we don't change, we, uh, we die, and that's why we call it the inflection point, uh, and we demand that there's this change in the industry, and that's why we're taking this presentation to all our staff uh, globally, 
uh, across 100 plus uh, offices at every level of the company because uh, we want to make sure that we speak the same language and we have a deep understanding of what is happening in the marketplace to share in the same way across geography with, uh, uh, with our clients. Thank you very much uh, and I think that uh, we now have a, a series of questions or, uh, or Q&A. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bernardo. Uh, before we move on into some questions, I've been asked to just remind everyone that it is possible to take questions from the audience. Uh, those of you who might have a, uh, a mobile email device in your pocket, if you have questions that you'd like to pose, if you could email those to moderator at demexico.com. Uh, the AV team will make sure that those come to the front and hopefully we'll be able to have some time for that. Um, I know we're running just a little bit late, so I think we're probably going to aim for about 10 minutes of Q&A and hopefully at least uh, delve into a few more of the points that Bernardo brought up. I um, particularly appreciated the number of examples uh, that you showed in terms of the, the ways in which different clients are using digital. And I think uh, the first question I'd like to start with is just the focus on earned and I suppose to a certain extent owned media assets uh, is certainly taking an increasingly um, large component of, of marketing budgets and even mind share of people involved in this business. Um, how would you say that it affects, or where, for that matter, does that leave paid media? Uh, and I think at the end of the day, maybe the simple question is, what, if you were sitting in front of a, a large brand media owner, paid media owner, what would your advice be to make sure that they still stay relevant and really core to global brand digital strategies? Well, a way to look at it is that a, a beautiful car with a great engine and a fantastic design doesn't actually move and perform its objective in life if it doesn't have a petrol. Uh, I think the paid for media is, is a petrol, is what generates the movement, is what links the consumer to owned media, is what drives this, uh, um, this uh, journey, this uh, conversation with, with the brand. And without pay for media, however good the old media is, it's difficult to find it, it's difficult to connect it, it's difficult to direct it to the right people. So I think the connection between paid for and owned generates the earned, generates the conversations, generates this uh, long-lasting uh, uh, benefit for, for the brands, but it just doesn't start without the paid for. So we, we, we tend to look at it as, as one integrated movement. What we lack is what I was saying before, we lack a measurement, we lack a new currency, we lack an index to measure these conversations and not just pay for and everything else in a separate way. Right. Although the fracture in the business model is that uh, largely the paid for media model has been paid for by brand advertising and brand advertising is still a small fracture of actual spend in digital. Uh, where would you see that heading directionally? Um, and you know, one would hope to think that uh, whereas two-thirds of, of overall marketing budgets are now devoted to brand and roughly a third go to direct response, and digital currently is more like a quarter going to brand and three quarters going to direct response. Where's the inflection point where brands start to really see digital as a, bar a broader brand platform? I think it depends which side uh, you look at it from, because if you look at it from the output, uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, there isn't enough money going into so-called uh, digital opportunities for uh, brand advertising. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the input into the consumer, a lot of the branding which is taking place uh, is happening in a digital environment. It just happens that it's not paid for. Right. Fair so enough. it is happening, uh, but it's not linked to the pay for. Uh, you, you can guess that that's, with so many hours spent there, uh, the two things will become more and more uh, together. And, uh, and I think that more and more we don't differentiate on brand advertising between digital and non-digital and non uh, media. It's just whatever is right for, for that specific action. So it's obviously an increasingly complex process. So where does that leave agencies? Do they become increasingly specialists or increasingly more simply aggregators and, in, in, uh, and uh, uh, aggregators and integrators, if you will? Well, uh, the first answer I would have given, how, how does it leave agencies, I would say poorer, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> because, uh, uh, because everything takes time and it's uh, more people that have to be dedicated to a lot more things that we have to do than we had in the past. But uh, uh, instead of looking at it uh, as a negative, uh, we, need them, we need to do more work to achieve the same results, let's look at it as a positive. And uh, the moment that we can, we can really have uh, better currencies uh, to measure output uh, and to measure what value we are delivering to the brands, uh, then it's much easier to have a proper remuneration which is linked to the value of what we deliver, not to the cost of the performance. And if it is linked to value, 
is not a percentage, is not, is not a fee, it's a proportion of the value that is created that normally uh, way pays for the, the hours that we have to, uh, to put in. Well, and on the subject of uh, remuneration, um, just a final question because I'm being uh, uh, met, I'm being memoed here that we're just about to run out of time. But uh, on the subject of remuneration, a lot of your presentation focused on fluid, focused, fast, forecastable. Again, I'll use the word again, but complexity seems to be uh, central and core to virtually every one of those. At the end of the day, it requires not just a complex strategy, but complex resources to deliver, and increasingly greater technology resources and people. Uh, you know, there's a kind of a mantra right now in the media world that every editor you should have a technologist. How, how many of your staff are going to be technologists? And I guess at the end of the day, how does that affect how much it costs? And finally, whether clients are ready for that cost to come through. Well, it's another very good question. Uh, we all have to invest a lot more in the agencies than we have in the past. And technology and talent uh, are becoming the two most important investments. Uh, I think that we're making the right investments and we have many technology or digitally based clients like uh, Intel, uh, Apple, uh, Sony, Vodafone. So I think that we've done relatively good, well, otherwise these clients wouldn't have followed us. But are we investing enough? What is enough? Uh, is this enough or do we need to do a bit more? No, I think that, I think that we always have to do a lot more and we need uh, uh, media owners, providers of content, uh, clients, uh, everybody in the industry to, uh, to play this game. We've recently done a big uh, global deal with, with Google, uh, which, which really is based on that. How do we tap into their technological resources and how do we benefit uh, from their investments for the benefit of our clients? How can we use what they've already done once uh, instead of us having to do it uh, again? And it goes without saying that their uh, technological capabilities are far superior to the one that any agency can have in, uh, in the world. So I think we need new ways of benefiting from the technology which, which exists, but the investments are unlimited and there is a lot more than we all need uh, to do in, uh, in that area. Very good. Well, I think we're going to have to close there, unfortunately, because, uh, like I say, we're needing to move on to the next panel, but I would just appreciate if you could show your appreciation for our speaker once again before we move on to the next panel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.